a licensing fee for that is like a teensy teensy tiny fraction of what a licensing fee is for like an artist not right. even a big artist like you don't even like like a licensing fee for a moonwalker song is like 20 times as much as the licensing fee for a harry springer song that i sold to a sound library well i'm adam i appreciate you doing this thank you so much of course thank you for having me adam of course uh this is about you your journey in music and uh we'll talk about everything that's going on and the the big announcement with warner chapel which is awesome awesome perfect sweet um just Based off the email, uh, you're in New York, I, I gather. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> are you originally from New York? I'm actually from Colorado. I moved here about a year and a half ago, probably. Okay, yeah, I was reading. I think I saw that the, the band started in, like, Denver area, right? Yeah, I'm from Denver. I guess I, like, started the project when I was, I guess, living in L.A. But, like, okay. you know, that's a during pandemic, that's a weird fever dream period. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's let's back up. So you're born in the what? Uh, you said Colorado, what? Denver area or no? Not. Denver. Yeah. I guess like just anyone who's not from Denver like wouldn't know. I I guess I'm I'm kind of close to like uh like Littleton um, which is on some people's radar because like Columbine and so but but I was kind of between like Denver and Littleton. I would say in a place called Inglewood. Okay. Wasn't it little? Is it Littleton? What was? Is that where it was? I don't know. Maybe I'm. Yeah, Columbine's like in in in, in Littleton's kind of big, but like uh, I'm between Littleton and um, and, okay, uh, and Denver, I'd say. Got it. Okay, right on. Um, what was that like? What was it like growing up there? Good. I actually I love Colorado. I think that um, you know, I feel like th this is probably like a relatively universal thing that people just like want a change at some point, and I definitely did. And then whenever I go back to Colorado. I st it still feels too close. Like I still wouldn't want to live there right now. It still feels too much like going back to being a kid, you sure. know, but I do think Colorado is amazing. I've got no, no, um, gripes with it whatsoever. Denver, it's changed a lot also like throughout my life, you know, it's becoming kind of a big, um, American city. Mm -hmm. And when I was growing up, it was a bit more quaint, you know what I mean? But like, so then as I was kind of getting older and, um, getting more invested in like the music scene and, you know, having more time to kind of explore things. I, I really, you know, it had everything that I needed to kind of like discover my interests and like figure out that I love great record stores, great coffee shops, great restaurants, great, you know, like great comic book stores, like everything that I like was there. I didn't have that kind of thing that a lot of people I think have moving to like a big city or something for the first time where like, you know, it's your first time kind of being around that much like activity and that many options. Colorado was great. It, it really was all there for me. Um, I just think I just needed to not be like where my parents were. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> uh, do where, you... you where, where are you located? Sorry, I don't, I should have. Oh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Nashville area. Um, okay, nice. But I'm originally from San Diego. So I also oh, awesome. left um, <laughs> my hometown and uh, my family and I, we moved here. So we love it, though. Oh, nice. Yeah, I love, I've not yet been to San Diego, but I love Nashville. Oh, yeah. Well, that's where Warner Chapel is, right? Nashville? Yeah. Yeah. And also, it's where Tom is. It's where, like, uh, my agent, every single person on the team essentially is in Nashville. <laughs> okay, right on. Um, do you come from a musical household or creative household at all? Uh, not really at all. My, I don't, like, I'm reluctant to say not creative, because, you know, like, my, my parents are, like, great writers, Okay. Um, but really not mute to the point where not only was nobody like a musician, but like I we grew up just kind of like listening to like top 40 radio. Like no one even cared about music enough to be like to choose the music that was on. Oh, it was literally okay. just like the most accessible things. The first time that I like found out like the music my parents liked was when I started playing guitar. And that was kind of like, oh, you should. My dad was like, you should listen to Led Zeppelin. My, like that was the first time my parents ever kind of like took initiative to like show me music. So I think music was just like never like nearly as part of a part of their lives beyond kind of just like, you know, whatever like the, the culture is at that time. Like when they were kids, it would have been more like you buy certain records and you listen to them at the turntable and we're adults. Like, you know, you listen to whatever's on like, you know, hits one or whatever. Like <laughs> yeah. it's not that they hated music, but they had no meaningful relationship with it at all. Got it. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, you said you started playing guitar. Was that the first instrument you learned how to play? 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. I then like thank God because I'm I I uh still am this way, but I used to be like really I really couldn't do something I like didn't like, you know what I mean? Like I couldn't really in school if I had to like read something if it wasn't something that interested me like I couldn't retain the information no matter what if you know there was a lot of sports I liked that I didn't like the the methods of practicing so it kind of put me off the sport like like if I started on piano for instance which generally speaking when people teach piano it's kind of regimented you know you, mm -hmm. you start with finger exercises and then you move to learning all of your major skills then you learn to you know like it's very kind of like there's it's like a structured method. yeah 100 percent exactly I think I'm going to sit down and learn how to play off. whatever you want to learn. Right. Exactly. And guitar, it was more. And and that's not to say the piano couldn't be that way, but like guitar teachers, like guitar players are just like chill. <laughs> like yeah. a guitar teacher doesn't approach things that way for better or for worse. Like I'm not saying that's, but like a guitar, I, even like I, I played classical guitar for all, even like my classical guitar teacher wouldn't approach things like that. Like there's just, there's just something different about guitar teachers than there is like a lot of other instrumental teachers you know what I mean it's like I did take some piano lessons at some point like after guitar and I quit I didn't like it I play piano like now just enough you know uh -huh. but um if I started there I probably would have just not been interested in music you know I think part of it was kind of like you know first lesson I learned a Green Day song like immediately oh, awesome. I was doing things <laughs> I like yeah, I that I that I uh, thought was cool. You know what I mean? What'd you learn? What was the first Green Day song? Brain Stew. Okay, there you go. Get in. <laughs> so that's I mean, awesome. Sure that's then you can so go home and play to the record, like right? I mean, is oh with yeah. piano? You're like okay, like gotta go practice the scale. But with something like if you learn a power chord, you're just like Dun -dun. and then you can just go home and play cool. along. Feels like yeah. you're a guitar player. Like right. you're a re and like you said, yeah, like I can actually play along with like a song, like a contemporary song that I've heard before. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. On piano, I, I remember going to my teacher that one time I ever made a request. I wanted to learn Don't Stop Believing and she had never heard the song. So she refused to teach it to me. She'd never. She's like, I lived in what? Hawaii in the 80s. Uh, I was, was like, was I don't think that's. Rock? And it's, yeah, like I wasn't alive in the 80s. I don't think that's an excuse. <laughs> yeah. They don't have any sort of music playing in Hawaii. Yeah. yeah I mean, that seems Hawaii. like just something you'd walk into like any sort of like bar or restaurant. Even like ring a know, bell. Or television. I mean, think of yeah. how many times you see that on TV. That's so funny. Never been to a wedding. Never been to a karaoke <laughs> right. bar. Never been to a game, a sports game of any sort. Right. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um. Okay, so you okay, you learned guitar. How old were you when you started to learn how to play guitar? It was for my 10th birthday that I got um the guitar and the amp and the lessons. That was like my birthday present. Oh, rad. What did you get? What kind of guitar? A like one of those um beginner packs where it comes with everything. Not the not the Fender one though. Everyone does. Oh yeah, the Squire pack. The Squire, yeah, Squire. yeah exactly. It wasn't that. Not for any I don't know why it wasn't. It was something like, you know, one one, one of those. Similar. Ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Similar, exactly. I didn't I know that that they say never to get rid of your first guitar. I did. It's long gone. Oh, really? That's a <laughs> And I don't miss it. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I sold it for nothing. Like I'm sure it was like I might as well have just kept it because it's not like it was worth anything. But um, yeah, it's gone. That's funny. Um, what did you start writing music or like start a band or anything like that? Were you still like in high school or yeah. anything like that? Oh, good question. I guess as soon as I started playing guitar, it was like that was all I cared about. Like there's like just my interests and the way I approached life and like it all was very kind of like I was I just became the person I am now as soon as that happened, you know, mm -hmm. um, for lack of like a better way of putting it. I guess no, you'll be. Um, but I, I remember, I always thought that the, I always wanted to be in a band. First of all, like that was always the thing, like, like what first drew me to it was just like, kind of like the Beatles. Like I saw a Beatles kind of show thing and I was like, well, this, I've never heard music like this. I've never seen a dynamic like this. Like, this is kind of exactly what I want. I'd always like started fake bands with like my friends when not a single one of us played instruments. Like I always wanted to be in a band. <laughs> and I, I remember always, doing, you like spend all this time on the name and the flyers the and like name, the logo and the name and, <laughs> and the logo exactly the <laughs> using even songs to cover thinking about the production at right. your first saturday night live performance when <laughs> no one can play a note of music 
Yeah. I always wanted to be in a band. I mean, that's like like our generation. I don't know. Being in a band was sick. That that might be like a dead thing now. I doubt that the new generation is like, oh man, if only I could be in a band. <laughs> but that was like the coolest thing when I was a mm-hmm. kid, you know. And did, did you but, eventually start one like that? Where once you could, I mean, once you could play guitar and and everything. Yeah. I was like, you start a band and do you play like around Denver area? Or you play at your school talent shows? Anything like that? Yeah, for sure. I guess. Um, I was, I, I I was always like starting bands with like my friends. Like my first kind of like show would have been at some type of school event with my fifth grade band, and we learned one song and there was no microphones. Like that was the first like show. And that's, again, nobody. That's in the early band, though. Like, I mean, fifth grade. Wow. I was like, I jumped into the deep end. Like I was bad. <laughs> like you asked, once I learned, did I start? I was in bands always, well before I really learned how to play the guitar. You know, like I just wanted to be in a band so bad. Um, and then even writing music, I never really thought about it, but like I would accidentally kind of like play something that sounded like a song because it was like I was ripping things out, you know what I mean? But like in my brain, I was like, oh, my God, like. I just came up with something that in my brain kind of feels like a song, you know what I mean? And again, like one of them, I think I accidentally wrote like Snow Hayo by the Red Hot Chili Peppers in a different key. One of them I accidentally wrote <laughs> Start Me Up in a different key. Like I, these were not original songs. And it's not like I had a desire to write songs, but I would just kind of like fuck around until a, a riff happened. And then mm-hmm. I was like, this is like, I wrote that because I didn't learn it. So I wrote it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so I was always like wanting to write, but I didn't probably care about writing music until like sixth grade. I got my mom's old laptop and I had garage band and, you know, I, I liked kind of, yeah, I, I like like putting stuff together. I'd say it's if I listen to it now, I doubt I would like refer to that as like you know music. But I but it felt like a creative venture. You know, it felt like I had like a product to listen to at the end of it, kind of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then at what point? I mean, you, you talked about moving to LA at one point, but like mm. you know, you're in high school. Are you still pursuing music? Like it sounds like you always wanted to be in a band. Was this like? Did you go to school for music or was like, okay, I want to do this forever. I I know that I'm going to pursue music no matter what. Yeah, it was definitely that. Like I knew immediately I was like, like I remember telling my mom, like if I have, if I like work at Guitar Center, I'll do that. And my mom, you know, like, was like no, you need more. You know, that's <laughs> not a good, you know, but like I, I like as a young kid, it was kind of like, I don't like you're kind of like go to like a good college and like get like, I don't like care about that. Like I need, like I literally just need it to be music. Um, and so at first, like everyone was trying to like talk me out of it, not like in a big way, but just kind of like, well, you can always like play guitar, like while you do other stuff like you, you know, right. like, no, like it's this is the only thing. There's nothing else. I don't care. And so, th- yeah, I was always, always in a in a relatively serious band in high school, like these early bands, like playing at that thing. That was just like me and my non musician friends, like messing around as soon as high school rolled around, like I was always at least like recording and doing shows, you know, and like I, I was in like a, a, a band always in high school, like, you know, kind of like those people who like are constantly in a relationship. <laughs> like as soon yeah. as this relationship <laughs> starts to die, they start looking for a new one. Like I was that way with bands. Like I was okay. starting bands while this band was breaking up. I was always, always in bands and playing shows. And I, I had, you know, would we'd somehow manage to record like something um yeah and it was pretty much i went to in, in sixth grade i went to a music school um sixth and seventh grade i think I, I was at this music school and then i just didn't like it and i was like i i can just kind of play guitar like like i had like an hour at the beginning of the day of, there was like guitar class and i was just kind of like i don't really care about that like that hour at the beginning of the day where i have to play music i don't like isn't necessarily making school a, a more pleasant experience for me you know mm-hmm. and it was really far and the kids were mean and so i i didn't want to stay there and then i didn't like go to go to college i i was always like my parents made me like apply to college and stuff like that i didn't want to go at all but my parents were like adamant they were like you would be literally the first person in the family to not go to college it's not happening and i remember when they came around my high school band like won a competition to play at like um at like an amphitheater we like opened a festival oh, wow. at an amphitheater like on the main stage and and so that was like my parents saw me like on the jumbotron and stuff and that was that was the day it was the summer before senior year and that was when they were like maybe you don't have to go to college like maybe this is a real thing and they kind of started to warm up to it 
And then I think my performance as a student just didn't ever get good. So they were like, I mean, whatever. <laughs> like they saw That's the writing awesome. on the wall. So you guys won a contest. Uh, your your high school band won a contest, and you got to play yeah. like where like Red Rocks or was it like a big amphitheater or something? It's actually so Red Rocks obviously is the big one. It's a venue in Colorado called Fiddler's Green, which is not as famous as Red Rocks, but it's actually like twice as big. Probably bigger, right? Um, okay. Yeah. So Red Rocks is like surprisingly small. I think a lot of people don't realize it's like nine thousand capacity or something like that. Um, and then Fiddler's is like also a great venue. It just doesn't have the history. So yeah, it's probably it's, just like the where like a massive band would play would be at this exactly point. exactly. It's kind of like um. Like we've got the basketball stadium, you know, which I think that once you reach a certain level, that's like the basketball stadium. stadiums than like football stadiums. Yeah, we've yeah. got the basketball stadium. This is the same size, but it's like an outdoor amphitheater, and it's far better. I actually love Fiddler Screen. Like it's actually, I think, a really cool venue. It's it's not like it's not like as there's something special about playing Red Rocks. Like that's on the bucket list. I don't think playing Fiddler's Green is on anyone's bucket list. You know. But, right, it is but it's a truly still, great it's, yeah, it's an amphitheater, right? I mean, you're, if you're playing yeah. amphitheaters, that's a huge deal. Um, and it was so, playing like we opened for like Cage the Elf and some bands that like I loved. So it was a big thing for me. It was the first time that my parents could kind of see something that they recognized as like, I don't, success isn't the right word, but like, but like that this is like an actual thing, you know what I mean? Like, not yeah. just kind of like me playing guitar. And and they were always proud, I'm like, oh, he's so good at guitar, but there was never, I think, like, a yeah, this is starting to like resemble a career, you know. Yeah, I mean, obviously, probably pretty valid. Not only for you, validating, but like for them to be like, "Wow, okay, yeah, yeah my my son's not just like playing, you know, the the local dive bar for seven people. It's like exactly they're out there on you know stage. It meant more to them thousands. than me. Yeah, 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 that yeah. at least as far as validation yeah. goes, like it was definitely. Because I, you know, was like any delusional young kid. I thought like we were the shit. That was like, <laughs> like of course we're here. Of course this is it. You know, but right. my parents were kind of like, uh, oh, wow. Like this is a this is an actual concert. When I think of a concert in my brain, it looks like this. Whereas right. I think that, you know, every other time it was like, yeah, sure. This is a fun little he goes plays these like, you know, dingy places and some people show up. But like, you know, whatever. That's so funny. I remember um, I interviewed. uh the guys from Taking Back Sunday, and they were telling me about how, like, their parents finally were like, "You guys made it." When they were like in the local paper, like when they got, yeah. but it was like they were on the cover of Alt Press and you know touring the whole country, and then when they can like, hold the newspaper, then they can the hold that newspaper is. and be like, you know, the local paper said something about them. It was like, oh yeah, well they made it now. <laughs> That's so cool that you interviewed Taking Back Sunday. I used to love this this same era, that kind of era. I was obsessed with like Taking Back Sunday, brand new, oh yeah, stuff like that. I loved all those bands, or still do, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, me too. Um, it was just funny. Yeah, I I remember them telling me that. I was like, That's hilarious. Like it was. It at is. That it's point, a generational thing. I think. Yeah. Like my parents. Right. That is. Even like in Moonwalker, you know, like they always thought it was cool, but like they didn't nothing process for them at all until, yeah, like publications. My parents liked write ups, even if it wasn't physical, but like, yeah, like, right. like any type of write up. And it was like, you know, that came relatively like late for for Moonwalker. You know, like I had like a career like this was like a full time job by the time they were like, wow, what a cool write up. And I was like, <laughs> all right, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Like, but sure, if that's what if that's what makes you recognize that that there's legs to this, then fantastic, you know. Sure, sure. Okay, so you have this band and you, you do that show. And does that band continue on for a while? Like through high school, like um yeah. was there aside from obviously that big show, like were you got did, was there some big moments with that band aside from that? Yeah, I got calling it a high school band is is pro that was just for the sake of the story. I, that was my it was called the Midnight Club. We started it in, you know, high junior year, maybe. Mm -hmm. And it actually took us to L.A. So like it it extended oh. beyond high school. And we were like, like, again, I don't I don't I don't want to disparage that band that that we were like a, a real band. We we moved to L.A. together. We like um I mean, shit, in some ways, it, there was more like we were signing to Caroline Records. We had like a top 10 alternative thing. Like it was in some, wow. ways, no, that's in huge. some ways it had more accolades than than Moonwalker. You know what I mean? But it just, um, 
you, you know, we, we were kids and we broke up for kid reasons and um, yeah, but it was a real band. It wasn't like we, you know, we, that kind of kick started us having like a local following in Colorado. So we, we were always able to like sell out pretty big venues there and had a pretty, you know, pretty substantial following there. Um, yeah. So that band, and, and then we, we didn't necessarily break up just the pandemic happened and that band functioned more like a normal band, you know, where like you need money to do their, to go work with a producer and, and kind of playing live was sort yeah. of the central thing, you know? And mm -hmm. so it just kind of fucked everything out. Like, like COVID really just left us like not knowing what to do. And I think we all kind of just started to get more interested in like our, our own things. And so we all ended up like by the time COVID was over, we all had like solo projects and we're all still good friends. Um, but there was no real breakup. It just kind of like COVID made it so we really couldn't operate how we were. And then I think rather than, and then our, I don't want to say we didn't adapt, but the adaptation was that we all ended up with solo projects, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, like yeah. the Midnight Club adapting to COVID was what made us realize that the Midnight Club was just not our, our perfect vehicle, you know? Got it. Okay. So yeah, it sounds like you did that band for a long time then and it had success, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um, it was like, I even look back, I, I like a lot of that music. You know, I, I definitely think that if, if and this is maybe not a good thing, but if COVID didn't happen, we probably would still maybe be a band. Yeah. And then yeah. obviously that changed everything, right? For, for yeah. everybody. But uh, yeah. And to me band. for the better, I'm happy it happened, you know? But who knows? It's it's hard to. It's like this is the only timeline I live in. So <laughs> right, right. So so once that you know COVID happens, you guys, everyone's inside. Is that when you start uh, putting together what became Moonwalker? For sure. Like okay. the way the Midnight Club operated, I would write the music uh, by myself, and so it just I I I'd kind of write it by myself and like demo it by myself, and then we had a, a producer we worked with. And then I remember there was a Midnight Club song in COVID where where right before co the lockdown happened, we started to be more happy with the demos than we were with the final product. Like that was just like a side thing. We were starting to feel that way. Mm -hmm. And so then we kept working on music at the beginning of COVID. And there was a song about the pandemic that I, it was the first time that like something clicked in my brain where I was like, I'm not viewing this as a demo. I'm viewing this as like, this is the, the finished song. And so that ended up being like the first song that I ever produced ever. You know what I mean? That was like the first time where kind of like, and it was really just a mindset shift, just the kind mm -hmm. of difference between like, just get it down at the demo and being like, well, let's get the perfect guitar take. Like, this is the song, you know what I mean? And so in at the beginning of COVID for the Midnight Club, I essentially started to develop all of the skills that became Moonwalker. And the Midnight Club was sort of in the songwriting from the songwriting perspective, it was kind of like a solo project for me, but I couldn't sing. I didn't, I couldn't play drums. Like I couldn't do these things. And so I started to, to help myself get better at production. I started to do those and I would sing. I was like just good enough at singing. I could just like melodyne myself to where I sounded kind of like passable. Um, and I would like make that music for sound library. So while I was making music for the Midnight Club, which let's say was the music that I kind of cared about, um, and I would do everything but not sing it, you know? Um, and then I would kind of be like, well, today I'll make a song that just sounds like a rip off of like Imagine Dragons or something like that wasn't necessarily a passion thing. Um, mm -hmm. But I kind of just wanted to see if I could do it. I would like sing it and sell them to these sound libraries while the Midnight Club was happening, I'd say. And then I wrote one song that I didn't want to give away. And um, I just decided to make it a solo project and then just kind of as again mindset thing as soon as I thought to myself like well this I'm not selling this and I'm not giving this to the midnight club like this is something else then I was just kind of like off to the races and I don't even think we all had a moment where we like sat down and we're like do you guys want to keep doing the midnight club I think it was really just like you know our singer got more into songwriting and he didn't want to give his songs to the midnight club and I kind of had my songs I'd write that were like this is a moonwalker song this is a midnight club song and at some point, it was just that all the good ones were were Moonwalker songs and the shitty ones were Club songs. All the throwaways that were like, oh, this, was, this is a good one. Like, the maybe Club. this isn't a thing that we care about anymore.
Um, what was that first song that you wrote that you wanted to hold to your like hold on to? Uh, it was called "Tear Down the Wall." Um, off it's out. It's out. It, it was the yeah, first. Yeah, it's song on that I first. Released. That yeah, okay. It was the first song you released. I was just yeah, curious. Yeah, it was that. Which obviously now is kind of like the order of of songs releasing gets like wiped away as soon as the album comes out and they get pulled right. from the DSPs and stuff. But yeah, that is fun fact. That is the first one. Wow. Okay. And what was sorry? I just curious on you were talking about writing songs for you'd sell the songs to, to what was that for? I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's I shouldn't have I should have elaborated more. It's no, these no, things no. called like sound libraries where um okay. basically uh like a t anyone could sign up, but it's mostly used by like TV shows, commercials, movies, ad campaigns that are on kind of like a lower budget. And so mm -hmm. you can go for two hundred dollars, you can just buy the rights to a song. Period. You don't have to go directly to the artist and pay them a licensing fee. You don't have to deal. Usually, Got it's it. kind of a one-time buyout. You might not even get anything on the back end. And um, it it totally every library has an entirely different like payment structure and stuff like that. Um, so I in and of I dealt with like five that were entirely entirely different payment structures. You know, um, but basically, in pretty much all of them. Either you just write a song and give it to them and maybe they'd, they'd pay you for the song and then never get, pay you again. Or maybe they don't pay you for the song, but they pay you when it gets licensed. Got it. Or maybe okay. if you're really lucky, this is where the money really starts to come in, that you can get hired for spec work where they're like, we need a song that sounds like this, that has this type of, I don't know, that's about this and we mm. need it done by here. And that's a higher paying job generally. Um but like, for, for example, it, you get a lot of money because that's kind of cutting straight to like straight to the to the heart of where a lot of money is in music, you know? Yeah. But a licensing fee for that is like a teensy, teensy, tiny fraction of what a licensing fee is for like an artist, not right. even a big artist. Like, you know, like like a licensing fee for a Moonwalker song is like 20 times as much as the licensing fee for a Harry Springer song that I sold to a sound library. You know, got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes a lot of so sense. So it's like, yeah, it so is, it's like, it, you yeah. gotta grind, you know? Yeah, no, no, I, I, I get it now. So yeah, you, because there's a bunch of different websites you can do that for. If you wanted to like music yeah. for the background of a commercial or something like that, and you didn't want to go pay, uh, you know, Journey for it, you'd find exactly. something and yeah. Okay, you could search sense. Journey on one of these websites and they'd literally and they'd... give you a band copying Journey. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. So I know exactly what, what you're doing. That's awesome. It's funny because yeah. like my, uh, we heard there's one they always my wife wa was watching the bachelor and there's one they always play where it's like a total ripoff of green day time of your life and it's like the first three chords are the same and then it changes to something different but they'll only really slice it like so like short that you think that you'd mistake wow. it yeah you're like oh they oh that then you once you kind of get a piece of it when it plays like a couple extra notes you're like oh it's, it's not it. Yeah. All this. <laughs> the one like just like what you just said, the one that I always heard for a long time, there was a commercial where there was a song that was such a ripoff of that one one Republic song called I think it's called I Lived, maybe similar kind of thing. Finger picking acoustic and just like uh -huh. some fucking lyrics about like life in the most vague possible way. And it was <laughs> it was I and like I do that. I do. The, I used to do the sound library stuff. You hear it all the time. I've never heard such a fucking direct rip off of something. I just thought it was hilarious. I mean, it, it's <laughs> yeah. honestly just hilarious at some point. But like we can either license this from Ryan Tedder for X million, or we can just have this person do the exact bucks. same thing. <laughs> Don't even have to reach out to him. Don't have to wait for him to clear it. Don't have to do. We just pay some website 200 bucks and we can do whatever we want with this thing. That's so funny. Um, a big okay. one is you can always tell with like you said the bachelor you can always tell with like love island and shit that's like the those dating shows are the first place where you'll notice like either cheap sync sound library stuff or even like royalty free stuff yeah you yeah, know? yeah yeah <laughs> that's so funny um okay so you're doing that obviously and then writing stuff for, for moonwalker and mm -hmm. um you put out that first song tear down the wall and from yeah. there are you like okay this is like what was the next kind of moment i mean you put an album out pretty quickly right after releasing yeah. stuff which is a bold move in this yeah in i world. guess it is funny i i'm trying to think of i guess now the 
what my thought process is even during this. I made like the whole, I didn't release anything until the record was like done, like completely and totally finished. I don't really know why. I guess I just like make records. Like, like even now, I never like make a song and I'm like, great, I'm done. You know what I mean? Like the song is like exciting and cool, but it's always, it's always like part of a bigger thing, whether that pans out or not. I don't ever kind of like write a song like, oh, great. This will be like a single. Now let's plan the music video or something. It's all, I'm just always thinking of things in like a project. Mm -hmm. Um, So I guess that was it. And it's a short record. So, you know, it was done relatively quickly. Um, I guess I do remember with releasing it. It was pretty like consistent kind of just like waterfall release, like once a month thing. Nothing really happened for me though, until definitely after that record was out for like, like, I, I might have been releasing singles for the next record, actually, by the time kind of I started to, like, have some success with Moonwalker. Like, it was, I was kind of just chugging along regardless of what was going on. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I wasn't, I wasn't doing the smart thing of, like, let's kind of move the needle a little bit. Then we can make another thing and move the needle a little bit. And make. I was just, like, releasing things regardless of, of <laughs> whether anybody heard it or not, you know? Right, right. Um, And I think that I was just like, I had heard, I had been told to wait so much, you know, like the Midnight Club, that was like the name of the game. Like our managers was like, wait, 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 wait for the right moment. Wait for the right single. This is, we got to do, it was so, so painstakingly like deliberate I that that it kind of became like not deliberate anymore. It was so intensely like we need to make the right moves. We need to take the right steps that at some point it was becoming like, not only are we not necessarily taking the right steps, but we're taking like one fiftieth as many steps as you need to take in this world. You know what I mean? In this, in the the modern framework of the music industry. This was when Billie Eilish was just starting to release music that they were recording on, on at home. And and we were starting to like warm up to the idea of like professional sounding music from professional artists can be made on their own kind of, on their own like prerogative and it can be released on their own prerogative and promoted on their own prerogative. And you can kind of just run your own thing. You know what I mean? You don't really need to wait for the advance to fund the creation of the music and then wait for the right time to drop the music. Cause that's the only way you have a chance at getting a big release, which is the only way that you have a chance. To get... It's just like, it, it used to be th- this really convoluted thing. And I think I just kind of sensed that that's not where we were headed mm-hmm. and and it definitely isn't, you know what I mean? Like now I right. think that the way that I release music is very much just the way that people release music now, you know, but there was definitely a time where it was like, why would you ever be waterfalling releases to an album when nobody is listening to the music? You know what I mean? Like it was, it was a time when it was, when it was not a smart like business thing. But then, I mean, like there's always like right now, a music video is not a smart business thing. There's no reason to have a music right. video, but I like them. I think they're cool. I like making them. So I want to do it, you know, mm-hmm. an album is not a smart business thing. You'd be, you'd be better off making singles, promoting it. When the single blows up, you release that single, promote more. That's the smart, like business thing. But like, I'm not like a businessman. Like, you know, when I have the record, I can think of a smart way to release it. Cause I like the record and I want people to hear it. But like, I'm the day that like, the way that I write music or the way that I kind of get myself excited about my own music is tied into like the business side of things. I'm going to like, hang it up. That's when you've lost the plot (laughs) in my opinion, you know, like this is a business acting like it's not, doesn't help anyone. But like, this is also music, like acting like this is any other type of business is also disingenuous. Like we are kind of dealing in this like magic category where like what makes music work, what makes people like music, what makes a song work is like magic. So you can't just like liken it to like releasing any other product in the world. You know, it is different. There is this other thing that can't be quantized. You can't put a number to just kind of like what releasing music does for you and for the people consuming it and and, and what a song that kind of like resonates with people, you know, what that does, I guess, if that makes sense. Like you've got to view it as a business thing, but like not until after you're done with the with the song or the record or whatever like and and that was i guess my thing was like was like once i finish the record i can think of a smart way to do this from like a business perspective but like when i'm making a record this isn't a business and i still feel that way like like when i'm making a record moonwalker is not a business moonwalker Mm -hmm. is like 
my just the name that I put to my musical kind of like you know output but then like when when it's done then I can think of a smart way to kind of stay in line with myself as an artist but also maximize the likelihood that more people will hear it or something um I feel like I've veered off course now I can't even remember what no. the question is but but yeah I guess that no, was, it was like that uh, uh, you answered the question I was just yeah curious well, I'm, you you mentioned like you know having a bunch of music out and then you know that songs in that album not performing until later like once yeah. you kind of got some success like what was kind of that moment like was there something that happened that really sparked i mean you have millions of streams on those songs some of those songs in that first album and then even into the next one like what like what drew people in like do you remember or like yeah. was there a moment that like kind of everything changed tiktok like tiktok i and i oh, do okay. i was i was so anti like at the beginning of moonwalker even the beginnings of releasing that music it was like i was working with like a company who was helping me like promote it and the big fight with that company and they were totally i mean they were totally right the big fight with that company was they were basically like you need to put your time into making tiktoks and you need to put your money into promoting tiktoks and i was like fuck that like i don't want to make tiktoks <laughs> yeah. I, by the way it is worth in defense of myself no one was making good tiktoks yet you know what i mean right. like this was like three songs had blown up on tiktok and it was like a b c d e f u and mad at disney like there was no like there was not this thing where everybody is is using this as just kind of like a tool there was like a way to promote music and i found it really uh embarrassing you know what i mean like there was kind of a clean cut way to promote your music on the app and and it did for sure require um being kind of cringe i, I guess <laughs> and it like changed over time to the point where now people just make small music videos really like like a successful music tiktok can just be like a cool shot with a good song and the right. and the person singing it you know like now it's totally not there anymore. But like in my defense, it was cringe. Like the people blowing up on TikTok at this time, that was not the trajectory I wanted my career to follow, you know? And so that was our big fight for the entire duration of working with them. I was still dragging my feet on TikTok. We were there, but like, I was not putting effort in. I was not caring about it. It was not the metric I was looking at. Um, and then... I'm really not actually sure at all when it changed for me, when I realized I should start putting effort into TikTok. But I do remember just kind of feeling like, I don't know how to make progress with this. Like, I don't know how to find fans. I don't know how to do this. And then like, you know, running ads and doing all this stuff and getting excited. Like, oh my God, the song got like a thousand streams yesterday or something. And then I had a TikTok do like, kind of well, like not even that, it got like 20,000 views or something. And it got like 3000 streams that night. And I was like, holy shit, like I just spent, if I spend a hundred dollars on ads and get a thousand streams, I get excited. Mm -hmm. And now suddenly I spent zero dollars on ads and got way. And so that was kind of the moment where I was like, this totally, this totally is the way to get people aware. And I sort of just, I was still making music videos, making music as though TikTok didn't exist as I still do. Um, but yeah, a lot of my excess effort was kind of going to figuring out how to like promote the music on TikTok. And there was just a very, one thing I always struggled with was I wanted to feel like as I put work into something, you were getting something in return. Like as you put work into music, you get music to listen to. There's your mm -hmm. payback. You know what I mean? Like you don't, making music is rewarding because then you get a song to listen to at the end of the day. Like that is motivating sending a bunch of you know cold emailing a bunch of record labels cold emailing a bunch of whatever do, doing anything you could possibly do to further your music career that's not actually making music if it doesn't work you kind of feel like you wasted your time you know what i mean like if, if i email 100 venues asking for shows and i don't get a show i just feel like that was a waste or at least i right. used to whether that's right or not it is the feeling you want something in exchange for the work that you've done you know what i mean whether it be like validation or like again something to consume that can make you excited or like money or like, you know just some you want to feel like your work that you don't that isn't necessarily work that you enjoy doing is benefiting you in some capacity and that was the first time that i was like 
I saw a very direct correlation between like, I put effort into something, I see a payback from that thing. You know what I mean? Like I put effort into making a TikTok, I get more people to listen to my music. It's not like a very kind of direct thing. So my brain liked that, you know, like my brain liked the idea that the more that I post on this app, the more people find my music on this app. There's a very direct, I put an hour into TikTok, I get an hour's worth of benefit after the fact, you know what I mean? So I just kind of started to put it all into that. And then things started to work, you know, because people obviously find my music from more than just like TikTok and Instagram, but I would still credit TikTok and Instagram as, as, as enabling me to do that. Like, I remember my biggest concern, like, how do I get the Spotify algorithm to work in my favor? Like, how do I do that? How do my old band did great on these algorithm things. And so I was like, how do I crack that? How do I crack that? The answer is get real people to listen to the music. Like the algorithm on Spotify was cracked as soon as there was real people listening. So mm-hmm. like people discover it through the Spotify algorithm. People discover it through playlists. People discover it through any other thing. But I would still say that those things only started working as soon as TikTok started working. Like it really, it legitimately begins with this one video doing moderately well. That was kind of one like, everything changed as far as like, you know, not the music, but as far as kind of like the perception of Moonwalker and, and Moonwalker being like, you know, like a job kind of thing. You right. Know? Yeah. And like the approach that you uh, take towards promoting the songs. I mean, like you yeah. said, if you're spending hours and hours and in, in doing things and putting in time and then you get no, you know, re- reward or even like anything out of it. Yeah. Like, I, I could see how you, it's like pretty defeating. You're like, why am it's I even exhausting. doing this yeah. now? Yeah. Like this yeah. is, I'm putting in all this time, this effort and nothing's coming of it. Uh, and, but then you see success. When you do music, you accept that like money's not the thing. You know right, what I mean? Like right, you're not right. doing this for money. So it's already like the fact that I'll do work and not get paid. I, ex- I accepted that way long ago. <laughs> yeah. Now you do work. You don't even get like, you don't even feel good after doing work. You don't get, anything from yeah. doing this work it's just it, it it will burn you out way 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 quicker than than like you can sustain you know sure sure but i mean obviously the tiktok thing worked for you and that's amazing i mean yeah. uh it yeah definitely drew a lot of people to sounds like that's what kind of drew people to you and and to know what moonwalker is and in the project yeah everything. I definitely um, owe like everything to to that, you know. Yeah. Like I I owe everything to I don't want to say like TikTok, but I definitely <laughs> owe everything to that shift. I don't know, that shift where like music was no longer discovered on radio stations and ads and blah blah blah. It was discovered on these algorithm-based apps, which m- might not be the greatest thing like for society at large, but like it really who the fuck knows if I would have found another path to this right. without it like the, the there was no way to do this without like labels and industry support and all of these things like you couldn't make it happen with sheer force of will and you kind of can now but it used to be like it doesn't matter how much you want it like if there's not an industry person repping for you you're not going to get into the spaces where people discover music it's just not going to happen you could make the greatest song in the universe and if the wrong person is handling the release the release will be heard by no one and subsequently the entire fucking success of the song long term is is tied to that failed release you know it's just not the way that the world is anymore thank like thank god i don't know if i could have made that happen for myself you know um like i don't know that's just that that's that's tricky you know yeah i mean it's totally different world right i mean yeah the fact that you know you have these apps like like tiktok I mean, especially in the, when it started, it was like such an open level playing field for everybody. It was like mm-hmm. if people liked it and they saw it on that for you page and they vote or it's almost like they're voting it up if they're liking it and commenting yeah. on it. It's like moving back up in the algorithm. But if if this, if no one engaged it, when it would go away. Do nothing. Yeah, you're back yeah. at square one anyway. Right. Yeah. And I spent, so, I mean, I spent like months, maybe it might have been a year or more. Yeah, just like fucking twiddling my thumbs on the app, getting nothing. (laughs) Same thing, putting in effort, getting nothing. And and yeah, I don't really even know why I stuck with it. Like I I really can't even can't even exactly remember my thought process throughout the whole thing. Cause I just remember like hating, hating it. I was like, I fought these people so, 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 so hard (laughs) on it, but I never stopped. Like I kept doing it for some reason, even though I 
I would have gone to bat for the fact that TikTok was not going to change the music industry. I would have died on that hill. But like, <laughs> thank God I didn't actually, right. you know, listen to myself, I guess. Yeah, 100 <laughs> percent. So you just released uh, or the, the most recent song you put out is Monkey See, Monkey Do. Yeah. And is that and then you sign with Warner Chapel, which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so are you doing an album or uh, is just singles right now? Like what's tell me about Monkey See, Monkey Do and like what what do you have coming yeah. up? I actually I have a record coming out next. Jeez. Wow. The 20th. Oh, I guess it's like yeah. The 20th. Friday. Actually, you have an album, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. And so sorry. I, I did. Last... Oh, I no, didn't no worries, read no. that like, you know, an hour and a half ago. Now, <laughs> no, totally it's spaced. also confusing because like. <laughs> The lead single from the album is the album name, which, which yeah, okay. makes it confusing, you know. <laughs> um, but yes, album's coming out. Monkey See Monkey Do, I guess, just like the last, yeah, that was the last kind of kind of single for that one. Okay. So tell me about the album. You're doing a tour and everything for it, I saw, right? Yeah, yeah. A, a proper release. Vinyl coming out with the album rather than wow. two years after the album now. Like a whole real, real thing. Um the album, let me, God, let me think. It's, um, I wrote it, it's, I, I didn't like take a different, I don't know, a, a lot of people, the, the experience of making records is totally different because they work with a different producer, they record it in a different place, they do, you know, something like that. I've like never changed my approach for as long as I've done Moonwalker. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't feel like, and in fact, I don't even like take really time between kind of writing. Like I'm just always writing and then I know that the record's done when the music I'm writing now is good, but it doesn't fit with that music. You know, that's kind of when it's like, I want to keep this music, but I don't want to put it on this record. That's when it's like, well, that record's done then, you know? So that I kind of cap it off uh, there. And so that happened here. And as a result of that, it's hard for me to kind of always be able to know what the difference between the records is. Like, I don't always have different inspirations or a different objective or anything like that. But this one is, very different like I, I can listen to it now with some distance between you know i finished it a while ago like i can listen it's a pretty huge departure from my other records um mostly not because i shifted my perspective but i feel like because my skills kind of just like caught up with myself like i almost feel like on the first two records like i was kind of going for this you know i just like wasn't a good enough producer i wasn't a good enough singer i wasn't good enough at kind of having social commentary but kind of stating myself eloquently like it, it just feels like this is how moonwalker has always sounded to me but like if i listen to kind of those first two records i can like objectively say that 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 it doesn't sound like that you know mm -hmm. so the new record i think that to me i couldn't really tell say anything that contributes to why it sounds different apart from just like getting better and maybe like i i, I lived in new york so i guess the other two were recorded in a different studio. So that changes things in ways that you probably don't even know, just like moving affects your creative output, affects your life in every way. Um, there was no real conscious decision. Like I didn't really have some people, including myself sometimes will be like, okay, this record, like they'll make almost like a mood board of like, these are the bands it's gonna sound like, this is gonna be the aesthetic of it. These are the lyrical themes we're talking about. This is the blah. I didn't really do that with this one. Fortunately, it ended up being like incredibly tight as far as all of those things goes. Like there really is only a couple central lyrical themes. There really is recurring sounds, recurring tones in a way that I think you'd expect from any good album. But like, I don't know, for the first time, I didn't really focus on those. And, and it turned out in those aspects, like better than it ever has by by quite a margin, in my opinion. Um, I don't know. I think it's a it's a I think it's my best record for sure. You know, I think it's just like, I feel like I've caught up to myself. I feel like I, I could be wrong, but I feel like in a year I will still be as proud of that record. You know, it won't be like I'm excited about it now, but then as I get better, I'll be like, oh shit, I wish I could fix that. I think that I will always look back on this record as like the best that it could have been. And like, I'll do other things, but this is, you know, this was, I have no regrets about the album for a change, you know? That's awesome. Yeah. And you've got... The record coming out, I think on what Friday, right? Coming up in a few days. Yeah, I think for the twentieth. Yeah, same yeah, day as Spider Man Two. Uh, <laughs> and then you've That's got a got tour kicking off like Thursday. Well, you're playing yeah. New York, but then you you you've got a bunch of shows coming. You're going all the way across the whole country. You're playing. I saw you yeah. in San Diego Soda Bar. That's a great place. Yeah, that'll be the first time I'm I'm in San Diego. I can't wait. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate 
you doing this today, Harry? Thank you so much, man. Oh, of course. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I have one more quick question for you. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Dang. I'm trying to think of of the best like general advice. I would guess so for artists, like for you know, putting aside like musicianship or something like that. But if you want to be kind of like um do, I guess I don't know, like like what I sort of do, you know. If you want to work in music, there's just a million ways. But like if you want to be like releasing your own records and kind of mm-hmm touring your own project, stuff like that. I would say that probably the biggest thing is know like what you want, be like uncompromising on the creative side of things and be insanely compromising on the non-creative side of things. Like have an idea of what you want and don't let anything else change the music you make and the content you make and the videos you make and whatever. Like no one's opinion trends none of that should have anything to do with it whatsoever but once the song is done very much stop being an artist and very much start being a shameless promoter you know i like i think would be the big like i saw at some point somebody said it like this like like be very like steadfast on what your goal is and be insanely flexible with how you would with how you reach that goal. And I think that that's kind of a, it's slightly, slightly different, you know, idea because, you, you know, because I don't think that anybody really has one central goal apart from like make music and get people to hear the music. But I would just say that like, there's no wrong way to get somebody to hear your music. Like there's no wrong way to get yourself out there and promote yourself and get people to come to the shows. Do not limit yourself on that. There's a lot of like, Oh, well this type of artist does this. And I don't want to be that type of artist. Like, your music is your artistic expression that's and then of course like you know the way you use social media the way you use ads the way you use any other promotional method is also should should be reflective of who you are for sure but um nobody's gonna give a shit that you're like not on tiktok like nobody's gonna be like oh this is you must be this type of musician because you're not like nobody cares like you should be willing to do anything you can to get the music out but that should all be like a thousand miles away from your brain when you're actually making the music. I love what it. I, I think be my biggest thing. That's what I wish I could go back. Oh, also follow your gut. Don't really listen to other people. You, you know how best to, to um, release the music and how best to do things. Like my biggest regret in the midnight club, we have so much music that never got released because people were telling us how to do things. And now the music will never come out because no one cares enough about it, myself included to finish it off and promote it and whatever, but I wish it was out. Like, I wish that that band, I wish that I could look back on that band and and it is how I wanted it to be at the time. You know, I wish I just kind of followed my gut. I think I knew better than what everybody was telling me at the time. Not because I was some fucking guru, but because like, I was the age of the people I was trying to promote to. I was discovering these new methods of discovering music as everyone else was i was younger than these old ass managers who were who hadn't broke a band since 1985 you know what i mean like like you probably know your audience better than anyone else and how to reach them better than anyone else um but you might not so be willing to try anything but also like go with your gut bring me the best words